And let's kick this off. So I actually, I actually found you through. I was looking up. I did an interview with Dutch Moyer, who was a uh, yeah, J- yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a JSOC guy, and he talked about the first yeah. mission into Afghanistan for the Delta dudes yeah. after 9-11. And in doing research for that clip that I cut out of the main interview, I came across your page, and I was like, oh, man. I mean, oh, no one wow. ever gets to hear from, from somebody from the 160th, so I'm glad you uh, made time for me today. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, I'm that guy. <laughs> hey, man, what <laughs> – What's that guy? You know, you you put some information out yeah, there. I well, think it's uh, something that people are interested in. You know. Well, and I I think it's critical too, and we we'll talk about this later. But one to you know educate Americans, and mm-hmm. two to you know help our future warriors, our future generations, as to what you know what the heck's going on out there. You know, and mm-hmm. and our you know these generations now they're all, all video gamers and wars on the screen and or movies or whatever, but, and I, I really, you know, I felt that it was important to do this or to write my book. And I was, it took me 15 years to do it. And I was, I had a whole lot of anxiety about it, but all, I mean, I, and I sent the manuscript off to friends of mine that are four-star generals, three-star generals and down sergeant major. And they're like, Hey, no, you go, you, you go, man. Good job. So that's awesome, man. I mean, I think like you said, the public deserves to know where their money's going, you know? So I think Absolutely. unclassified operations and stuff that's out in, in the clear, no reason not to at least inform the yep. public, you know? And I think we have a really right. bad, I'm sure you saw this to the extreme, but we overclassify stuff in the military to the point where we it's, do. Like, it's like, <laughs> really basic stuff that you can let find on, on the internet anywhere. The military won't even talk about, or, or you can get in trouble or what. It's just kind of ridiculous. So I think it's important. And I also think it's, it's history, you know, like people will look in a history book and go, Oh, you know, Iraq, Oh, Fallujah, Ramadi, whatever. And then, Oh, yeah. Afghanistan, you know, like it's, it'll yeah. be very broad, but there's a lot of individuals like yourself, like myself, like a lot of my friends, your friends that went out there mm-hmm. and did work. You know, and their their yes. story deserves to be told and remembered and stuff. So, re- again, I really appreciate you coming on. I thought it was interesting that you didn't start out as a pilot. You came in the military, in the Army, as a infantryman. Yeah. What made you decide to join? I mean, you're, you're of the era, you were probably a child when Vietnam was going on. What was the sentiment in joining the military in that, in that era? Yeah, I was, you know, I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, and, you know, we had all of two or three channels back in those days. And that, and that's, that's what was on. Uh, my dad was in the military. He, he retired after 30 years and he was in the air force and, you know, so I was around aviation and, and that part of it. But I, you know, and just watching because, you know, that was the helicopter war. That was the first time we had introduced that in any type of warfare other than medevac in Korea. Mm-hmm. And, you know, helos were just kind of getting off the ground. No, yeah. no pun intended. But I, I just, I had an infatuation with the whirlybirds and I just thought they were cool. And of course I was around all kind of jets back in the, you know, sixties and seventies and watching that stuff take off and land at different bases. And, but, and, and I didn't have a college degree at the time. So the, you know, the army was my instrument to get to go fly. That was my whole plan from the time I enlisted. And my father, he, that's what he recommended. He said, I recommend you go in, go enlisted, figure out the army and then apply for flight school. That's their warrant officer program. And they're, you know, the recruiting or their selling point high school to flight school. And when I went through flight school in 89, we, we literally, we had two guys that are kids, but they were 18 years old and they went from high school to the army basic and then found themselves in flight school flying helicopters. So crazy. 18. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's a good program. And, you know, and it, and it gives us, I mean, the majority of the pilots in the army, probably, I don't know the numbers now, but I'd say at least 80, 85% are warrant officers. Mm-hmm. So we're in between the enlisted 
and the NCOs, and then the commissioned officers. So yeah. can you kind of explain the difference between what warrant officer pilots do in comparison to the, well, like, why not just make them all warrant officers? Why even have commissioned officer pilots? It's, it's for the commission officers are put in leadership positions. So platoon leader, company commander, battalion commander, brigade commander, division commander. So those, you know, that we're, the warrant officers are technically and tactically proficient mm -hmm. in our profession. So we're the experts in aviation in the Army. And I'm sure it's like the Air Force is, or, you know, the fighter guys, the lift guys, the bomber guys. You know, whatever the case so yeah you know, we're we're the, ones that, we're the ones that go do the deed go do the deed for sure yeah i mean it's such a cool job i have a buddy right now who's in uh flight school for apaches and he loves it oh you know, no he was a listed marine and then he went over he was a jtac and stuff in the marines and now he's in the army and uh he's oh, i yeah. think he's almost done there which is i mean what a cool job right how could it not be cool flying around uh, in an apache yeah. you know Yep, flying around in an air conditioned tandem seated chariot from hell. Yeah, right. Did when you were wanting to, okay, so you came in and listed into the infantry. Was was there like a, I don't know, were there resources for you to go become a pilot? And I mean, I know you can go and apply to be the warrant officer program and stuff like that. Were there people there encouraging that, or is that something you had to like seek out on your own? It, it's a dual edged sword. So my my command at the 101st they supported it 100 percent and i just i had our brigade commander was colonel hagler his nickname raging ralph hagler and he was the 275 commander the ranger battalion when they jumped into grenada mm. and man he was just and he's been a long time friend and but he was a huge proponent of it. And, you know, all of us that, that wanted to go do that, he, other than being a ranger in the ranger, <laughs> he, you know, he's like, okay, go fly helicopters and go support your brothers on the ground. And For I sure. Said, Roger that. Yeah. I mean, the, we didn't have any of the technology. We didn't have a study guide. We didn't have anything mm -hmm. back then that I, that I knew of you you had to go take a fast test. That's a flight apt aptitude and selection test. And, and they still do today. It's, it's called something else. So you went and took it. And if you passed it, of course you had to have a GT of, I don't remember what it was back then. I think 110, and that's, Sounds that's right. as bad when you come in and yeah, and then, so you took the fast test, you pass it, and then you had to go get a, a, a class one flight physical to make sure you pass the physical requirements, height, eyesight, you know, all those different things. Yeah. And then you put a, you, you put a packet together and, it, and it's a resume, but you know, what is a E3 in the army? <laughs> you know, what, what do you have? But yeah, you just put everything in there and then, then it goes off to the board for the warrant officer selection board. And yeah, on from there. I, I think that gives you an interesting perspective as a pilot, right? Coming from the infantry, because you understand those ground, you know, those ground tactics, what's actually happening with the maneuver element compared to maybe someone that comes from, I don't know, like the logistics or even from the flight community in the army. Sure. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it does. It, it gives us an edge and it, and it puts us ahead of the guys that, that don't know that ground scheme maneuver or, you know, what's going on down there? How is this platoon maneuvering or this company or this brigade or, mm -hmm. you know, on and on and on. So, yeah. And, and you know, speaking of that, er, every one of the guys from B Company, when I was flying Little Bird A6s, we were all former infantry guys or rangers. Oh, wow. We had a couple Delta guys that flew. Yeah. So, and that's the hardest thing once you get, get to the unit the 160th is you have to learn you have to work with all these different tiers and special operations mm -hmm. to learn how they operate so that takes time you know it For takes sure. 18 to 24 months to train a, a new aviator in the gun on the gun side in the 160th because we have to work with we have to work with the rangers we have to work with delta and some of the other soft guys that we work with out there but to learn you know their tactics and all that stuff so 
Yeah, for sure. Especially because yep. they're all a little different. They all have s- similar but different missions. You know, if you're landing on a ship, is going to be way different than landing on top of a, a skyscraper right. in some city. Yeah, Absolutely. for yeah. sure. What was Everybody the f- had their specialty. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure, like everything else within the air community and stuff like that, there's ratings for everything. Yeah. You know, you got to check that box and make sure you're within that time frame and stuff. Yeah. Um, what was the first platform that you were assigned to fly? Like, what? How did you have a choice and what did you want to get into at the time? Yeah, we <clears throat> you did. You had a dream sheet in flight school. And, of course, you know, being from where I was from and, and a shooter, but I just wanted to go shoot things and blow shit up. So... Can be I that. asked for, I asked for Cobras, you know, yeah. and that, you know, it goes back to my childhood watching, you know, new, the news and, and reading books about Vietnam or seeing movies about the, you know, the snakes. And mm-hmm. that was the first tandem seat air conditioned chariot from hell. But I, I'll tell you a story we were we were out at JRTC used to be out at Fort Chaffee in Arkansas, Western Arkansas. And then, Eastern Oklahoma, and we were out there doing a big, big division exercise one time, and I was on the brigade recce team, and there was a, there were six of us, and we'd been humping all night, and we, we came up this mountain, you know, about, I don't know, 100, 105 pound rucksacks, and there's, there's, two, there's two Cobras parked there in this field, and here's the pilots, they got their cab hats on, sitting in lawn chairs that had a Coleman stove out frying <laughs> eggs and bacon. <laughs> and we all look at each other and I said, okay, that's what I want to do right there. Oh yeah. And uh, we walked, they were from 517 or no correction, uh, 217 cab, I think out of Campbell, they supported the 101st. Yeah. So we, we walked over and they walked, welcomed us in, gave us some coffee and fed us and, you know, showed us the aircraft and, and I told them, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to apply for flight school. And they were like, oh, cool, man. They're like, yeah, this is, this is the way to go right here. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. I, I, so my first tour was flying Cobras. That's what I'd put on my, my dream sheet. Nobody wanted guns. Nobody, everybody wanted to fly the Black Hawk, you know, and everybody wanted to fly Chinooks. Really? And, yep. Yep, sure I would, it did. seemed like people would want to be in the Cobra or in a shooter platform. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the Apache, that was 89, 90s. So the Apache was just coming on. And uh, What model Cobra did you learn in? The F model. Okay. Yep. Have you seen the Zulus? I've flown in a Z. In oh, a Zulu. yeah? What'd you think? They're badass machines. <laughs> <laughs> the Army should have. Yeah, the Army should have just went to the Zulu. You think so? Yeah. You, over the yep. Apache? Yep, I do. Man, that's the a... The Apache's a great machine. It is, but just being a Cobra guy and, you know, falling in love with that, that helicopter mm-hmm. and flying it and, um, yeah, plus of the, Mar- the Marine Corps whiskeys, they got piss tubes in them. Oh, <laughs> really? I, I didn't I know that. like, yes. <laughs> We don't have that in the army. That's funny. I didn't even know that. That's yep, pretty funny. Sure they used to. I know multiple Cobra guys, and they love it. You know, and yeah. that's interesting. Obviously, you don't meet too many army guys that are Cobra pilots because the Apache took over, and like you said, in like eighty nine, yeah. ninety time frame. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of people may not know, like the the Cobra started in Vietnam. You know, with the army and doing those missions, and it was interesting too. Like the, I think the initial one had the front turret, not just a gun. It also had like the Mark 19 kind of grenade launcher on it as well. So it was yeah, a gun and a grenade launcher. Yeah. It had a GE mini gun and then a 40 Mike Mike grenade launcher chunker. Yeah. I had a, I don't know what I have it up on the bookshelf. I had a book that talked about, um, Vietnam, like aviation. And they were, they were talking about using the first, um, flechette rockets and they're like, these yeah. aren't effective. They're not working. And they didn't realize like the effects because they're flying. And then one of them shot one over water and saw all the the splash. Saw and was like, foot, oh man. shit, yeah, like this is way crazier than yeah. we thought. Yeah, I yeah, love me some jets. Yeah, I bet, man. I bet. What an interesting platform, though. How long did you? So I assume you at some point you transitioned to the Apache. 
Yes, my first tour, I flew Cobras. I went to Korea and flew with the 517 Cav. And at the time, I was 1990, and uh, Camp Casey, 2ID, they were up, up north. But we were the furthest northern, you know, deployed reaction force in that country at the time. And it, it was, a, I, I really, I had my, you know, it was good and bad. I left a seven month pregnant wife mm -hmm. and my, you know, my, my senior taxes, if the army wanted you to have a family, they would have issued you one, yeah. their can of coker. And I said, Roger that. But, and he also mentored me that, Hey, listen, man, yeah, it's going to suck, but it, it's going to be, you're going to get so much experience mm -hmm. in the different environments over in that country. So we, but we got to fly over water. We got to fly mountains. We got to fly in the snow. We got to fly in the urban areas around Seoul and, you know, Vils and things like that. But yeah, it was, it was, it was a really good experience. And I, I really got to learn how to fly the machine. So yeah, it, we had awesome IPs. And, uh, something like that, you know, in Korea, since it's such like a, there's that hard line, right? And yeah. it's been like that hard line for a long time of yes. these North Koreans and South Koreans facing each other. When you're over there, does it feel like it's like it's real or does it feel like another training thing just because it's like, eh, what's actually going to happen? Are they actually going to attack or did no, it feel it, like you were serious, you know, in it? Absolutely. I mean, we flew armed aircraft. Yeah. Yes. We flew the border. We flew the parallel up there. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, it was a real world mission at the time. It was the only one going on. And, and, uh, you know, it was just immediately following the Reagan administration and it was serious business. We had a couple border incursions while I was there mm. and actually launched, we were the alert, you know, the fast, the quick reaction force for the infantry units there. So. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was, cool. It was I, cool. I never had the opportunity to go there. I think it's fascinating. I think North Korea, because it's that pariah state that no one really knows what's mm -hmm. going on in there. It's like fascinating. It's yeah. like, man, I wish I could visit and like see stuff, see what's actually going on there with that culture. But yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard good and bad about Korea. Some people don't like getting stationed there and stuff. Like yeah, that. I did. I hated it, but I love flying there. Yeah, I really did. So is that kind of experience? Did it did it transition well into the Apache when you came? So did when you come back? Is that when you started your transition? Yes, I came back in '91. Actually, right before Desert Storm had started, Desert Shield had been going on, mm -hmm. and they had they told us they would forecast a great loss of Apache pilots <laughs> when the you know when the war ever yeah. started and. And so they had us, you know, they pushed us, pushed us right into Rucker. We did a shortened version of the transition, you know, to get us ready to go into combat. And I, I actually had orders to, uh, yeah, Saudi and then, or yeah, Saudi or Kuwait and, you know, go meet up with the, I was going to the first of the 101st after my transition, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cody at the time, which later became four-star general Cody and vice chief staff, of the army. Oh, wow. But yep. 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 By the time I got to Campbell, they had just, they had just came back. Yeah. It's <laughs> a like, quick well, war. Yeah. How's the 96 hour war boys? Oh yeah, man. It was awesome. But, but that battalion fired the first shots in mm -hmm. desert storm. First, the hundred first. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. one of, I can't, I'm sure you know which one it is, but one of those, gun cam videos from the Apache hitting the friendly forces is one that we oh, used yeah. a lot as a fratricide brief, you know, and it was just like to listen to the comms and kind of explain what's going on to the students and stuff. That always seemed like a really effective one because it's, there's a lot of information about it, you know, very much. Yeah. You can look in that FLIR and we watched it because it's a learning tool for sure. And, you know, always keep in mind out of bad things come things that we can, fix and that we can learn from mm -hmm. in our debriefs or after action reviews like you're familiar with and i mean we we studied it and watched it but i was like the first i remember the first time it flashed up and that was a battalion commander in the front yeah. seat yeah and i was like holy crap that's a that's an m113 that's one of ours and he launched that stuff and says 
Remember what he said? He said, I, I hope, hope that's a bad not. guy. I was yeah. like, no fucking way did he just say that. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy, man. That's all, you know, when I was in, it was something we'd always try to tell the new JTACs in the fire sport community. It's like, mm -hmm. these rules are written yeah. in blood. We're playing with yes. live ordinance, man. We're slinging live rounds, and sometimes they're close to us. So you can't you can't be wrong. You know you have no. to you have to you make sure be, everything's correct. You can't be ninety nine point nine percent. You must be one hundred percent. I always told the guys. I said, and I'm a shooting instructor also, but and I always tell the guys, once you launch a bullet, there's no bringing it back. Mm -hmm. So you make dang sure you're a hundred percent that that's the target you want to shoot. Yeah, for sure. Every, yeah. Yeah. And, it, and of course being in the fires community, I've been on the, the, uh, bad end of someone messing up. You know, we had one of my very first, my very first field op as an artilleryman, as a forward observer, the check round, which is what they shoot to make sure everything's mm -hmm. safe landed 50 meters yeah. from us landed outside of the impact area and 50 meters no from our camp. 50 meters oh from us God. man i didn't remember being Holy inside the tent because we were in the fire support coordination center doing the approvals mm -hmm. and i hear shot target number two and you hear the boom off in the distance yeah and i just hear this hear boom and i'm yeah. like this is my first field op i'm like this is le way louder out here by the impact area and someone's like that was too loud and then we ran yeah. outside and, you know, check fire started. Oh, gone. That's what happens, man. And that's why these rules, again, are written in blood, you know, like shit like that could, could occur at any time. And in the aviation yeah. community, yeah. it's even worse because hell, the vehicle you're flying around in could be anything could happen at any point. Now it's, you know, no yeah. longer flying, you know, you got to deal with that situation. So, and you know, man, it's, it's chaos when the ground force is maneuvering and they, they take contact and i mean it, it just is it's, yeah you're you trying to work on a timeline you got timings for different fire support assets you got timings for movements and stuff and you ain't the only show in town maybe there's artillery coming over or naval <laughs> gunfire coming yeah. overhead or drones or tomahawks or yeah it's i know you had a yeah. pretty good background in fire support in the army also so i think the marine corps prides itself on that combined arms you know, yes. like we don't plan a fire support mission unless it includes like we're always like, right. where's the artillery? Where's the indirect fire? We're shooting mortars or something. We're not just doing aviation or vice versa. Right. Do you. I, but the Army's not necessarily like that. Mm -mm. I always said the Marine Corps, we need to study them. They do it right. They, they really. And we would work with WTI and go out to Mots. Yep. And we had an exchange program with the Marine Corps and we had a, we had a Cobra guy. They were a captain. We took the, the number one guy from Mott's or WTI and they came and did a three year tour with us and B company in the one sixtieth. And then our guys would go out and, you know, spend a couple months at WTI Mott's and mm -hmm. just trading off, you know, tactics and what we learn. And, and then, yeah. And the, I mean, they, the Marine Corps sent the, best marine cobra pilots in the marine corps man to be with us but they went through the whole they had to go through green platoon they had to go through the whole you know the whole training phase you know 18 24 months and uh, yeah they're great dudes man semper fi <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure i mean i love having marine pilots overhead and it's the thing about the cobra pilots and the huey pilots they fly mm -hmm. way differently than your than your Apache pilot. Yes. The tactics are way yeah. different. Apaches will mm -hmm. hover and fire from a great distance, yeah. whereas Cobras are like diving in like angry bees, you know, just one after another, just attacking on the target. It's yeah, um, these it's good so tactics on target, man. They're you know they're covering each other and they're they're doing their one eighty outs and yeah they. They do a great job. It's an awesome thing to watch. It's a, it's a great time. You know, I imagine you, you got to be on the flying end of it. I imagine it's an awesome opportunity to yeah. like be, be oh, in yes. that seat. Yep. Yes, sir. So how was, you know, we're talking about Marines come over to, over to one sixtieth, and, and you also transitioned to multiple aircraft. How hard is it to sit down in a different cockpit? You know, how was it to go from a Cobra to an Apache? Was it, 
a lot different. I mean, obviously there's different systems and stuff you have to learn in mm-hmm. it, but just flying in general is basically the same, right? Like once you learn a helo, yes. the, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The flying's pretty close. The Apache, you know, of course it had a whole heck of a lot more power. It was more tech technologically advanced. It had the forward looking infrared, it had FLIR on the TAS and then the, the back seat the pilot flew with the little PNVS, the FLIR monocle over his eye. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it, it was just, it was different, but it wasn't that, it wasn't that tough of a transition. Yeah. Yeah. Different missile systems. It had the 30 mic mic gun on it and which is a very accurate course, 19 shot rocket pods and it had the hellfire. You know, we had the tow and the, the old, the old got it by wire, you know, yeah. you flew, you literally flew that missile into your target. So those only yeah. recently stopped, you know, they were, I think they're completely out of the inventory now, but I mean, that's a more mm-hmm. recent thing. I saw a lot. I know a lot of guys would have issues out in like 29 palms when they'd go out to do a shoot and a, a Cobra would bring a tow out and you get a lot of toes stuck on the wire or stuck on the rail kind of deals where it didn't yeah. launch and issues like that. So the Hellfire is obviously a way step up from what the toe yes. was. But that thing was also very effective. Very, very effective. Very effective. Now they have different models of it. They have different models of the Hellfire. You know, mm-hmm. they, yeah. As, you know, as we, this country has learned in warfare and, you know, we, we learn the enemy, the enemy's not stupid and, you know, they learn us. And so we had to develop and come up with different, you know, different weapon systems to make us more efficient on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. You know, like, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, you got, we got that new one now. That's just a samurai knives freaking flying out of that guy, you know, not even yeah. any explosives and stuff. And the low yeah. explosive ones before the, um, I can't remember which model it was, but the low collateral damage ones, those are really mm-hmm. effective and without doing, yes. obviously without doing much collateral damage, almost, yeah. almost too low collateral damage where if you didn't yeah. hit directly on the guy, we had so many guys that would like, you could hear that hellfire missile coming in and you'd see the video of them like run and then like sprint real fast <laughs> right before it hit yeah. and they'd get right in front of the blast and it would just yeah. injure them and it wouldn't kill them. You know, that yeah. happened multiple times. Yeah. So, um, yes. go ahead. No, I said yes, sir. Oh, okay. Well, please don't do that. You know, it's call me sir. Um, when, uh, how long were you in the Apache before you got the call, or did you apply to go almost, over the one sixtieth? Almost three years. Yeah. yeah, I was in the hundred first, and I, I mean, when I got there, I, you know, I, and I told them, I says, hey, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to put my, my end goal is to go to the one sixtieth, and. And they and they supported. I had great IPs and you know great NCOs, great soldiers, and and uh, so yeah, that was yeah, it was probably almost three years. Is that, that pretty trip. common? Do do most pilots like want to go there to want to get to that level, or is that? I don't think so. Because it's a lot of work. I mean, I think. Hard. Non hard. people outside of the military to see like fighter pilots and hel- helicopter pilots mm-hmm. and they're like wow it looks super cool and it's I mean obviously a super cool job but you know one of my buddies is a Harrier pilot and he's like man it's an awesome job but it's so stressful he's like every time yeah. you go up every time you go up you're being graded on something you know you're doing some kind of task that needs to be completed plus just the yeah. inherent danger of flying around yes. and doing some of the crazy stuff that pilots have to do so. Yes, do you think some guys like come in, become a pilot and they're like, you know, this is enough for me. This is enough. Like I'm living close enough to the edge. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I've, I've known some and it's not for everybody. Yeah. It really isn't. And that, you know, and it, I mean, the regiment's been around long enough, the one sixtieth that, you know, word gets out and, for sure. you know, a guy will come try out and he'll say, Hey, this ain't for me or mama's not happy or, Mm-hmm. You know, we average 290 days a year gone. I mean, we're training, training, training. The train never stops. Mm-hmm. And it just, you know, that's just not for some guys. And that's sure. okay. And, uh, yeah, I was, you know, I saw a few where they just they couldn't do it. They just they couldn't shoot. They couldn't fly. 
And the MD 530, the little bird, it, it's just a whole different animal, man. It, it's a hard platform to fly. And now not only are you flying, but now you got to get everything lined up and you got to shoot. Mm-hmm. And everybody always asks us or they chuckle. They're like, how do you aim this thing? You know, the Apache's got all these electronics, uh, HUD and the Cobra had this. And I said, we use a grease pencil mark. Yep. <laughs> and they're like, what? I said, yeah, it's called a pepper. And, and it takes us to train a guy probably about a year to get him to figure out, you know, where to put that, that grease pencil mark on that windscreen because, because of our standards are so extremely high and we shoot very close to friendlies. So for sure. Yeah. It's just, you know, it, it takes three and four trips a week to the range and we go shoot and you become proficient or you go somewhere else. Not even proficient, like proficient at a completely different level. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not even, that's like someone that says they go and shoot at the range maybe weekly or every other week compared to somebody that shoots almost daily. You know, the proficiency there is going to be at just a different level altogether. Yes, it's absolutely. I think that's, you know, this 290 days a year out out on the road doing stuff is pretty common for people that don't know within the SOCOM community. That's the life you're signing up for, you know, and that's and family signing up for too. That's a thing that a lot of the recruiters bring up to guys that are signing up for it. They're like, Hey, be aware. Like how's things with the marriage? You know, how are things with whatever? Because this is a serious, you're seriously stepping out away from home for an extended period of time. And it's not like a deployment where like, okay, I'm gone for seven months and then I come back and then I'm here. It's a constant deployment slash training, you know? Yes. Yeah. And you know, I mean, especially being a JTAC and I mean, we're always shooting and moving always. And you, you have to, that's the only way to be as good as you need to be when it, you know, comes down to those like really hard missions and stuff. So when you apply, yeah, we'll train. go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. But I was going to say, when you apply to the one sixtieth, what was, can you, can you talk us through like the process of how you, how, let's say someone out there is applying. What's the process from like, I'm flying a, a black Hawk to, to how long does it take me to get into the seat of a little bird? You know? Well, historically that, you know, the lift guys, they'll go to the left side of the one sixtieth. So the Black Hawk guy will go to Black Hawk. Mm-hmm. Chinook guys will go to Chinooks. And we used to draw for the gun side, we draw from from OH fifty eight or Kiowas. And at the time I was like the last Apache guy that the Department of the Army DA let go. Hmm. They fought me and fought me because they spend, I don't know, millions of dollars to get us trained For sure. and they want their, you know, they want that back. Yeah. And I, I actually, I actually, so, you know, I, I put all my stuff in, I had assessed, I'd been picked up and the department of the army didn't want to let her, did not want to release me. So I got my truck I was at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I drove about, I don't know, 16 hours all night to 200 Stovall Street in Washington, D.C., where our, our uh, you know, warrant officer headquarters is. Oh, no way. And I went upstairs, and I sat down in front of my manager's desk, and I said, you're either going to release me or I'm getting out. <laughs> and he said, okay, Greg. <laughs> I said, sign the papers right now. And he did. And yeah, but I was one of the last guys that they let go to, to the one sixtieth. That's how you I'm know sure you got to you got to take your destiny into your own hands, right? You got to make things happen. If it's not work going your way, you got to do something. You can't just sit yeah, there and be a passenger in life. Yes, sir. But I was determined. I said, man, I, this is what I want to do. I've done. I've met the standards. I've worked hard. This is where I want to be. So. Now you're you're transitioning from this modern. Oh, my video is flashing off and on. Oh, you're, you I don't know you're what back. that was. Uh, so you're transitioning from this modern, computerized, multi-weapons, you know, aircraft into this, to the Little Bird, which for those that don't know, is very basic. It's very raw aircraft. There's nothing on it because it's saving all the weight for the ammunition and cargo, 
right? Yep, exactly, exactly. Yeah, the hell it, that and that you know, it was a tough transition because you you go from an Apache that has hydraulic assist and it has almost like an autopilot, you know, mm-hmm. when you're flying and it's it's a very stable platform to a platform that was designed and developed in 1958 and is still flying today. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the greatest helicopter ever built on the planet. <laughs> but there's no hydraulics in that helicopter. There's it, It's literally seat of the pants flying. Yeah. You kind of know what that, you know, the old guys are like, oh, yeah, it's seat of the pants flying because they didn't have that stick and rudder, you know, no hydraulics, no assist, no technology. Yeah. And uh, but the helicopter flies really, really different. It's, it's not a forgiving aircraft, so it'll, it'll get away from you in the blink of an eye. But it is like driving a freaking Ferrari, man. It is a cool little helicopter. What kind of changes did you see in the helicopter while you were in the unit? Well, I was, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, just over the years of global war on terror, I mean, I'm sure there were some kind of changes made in little we things. Had, that... Right. We had started uh, probably 2000. So we, we were looking at, you know, and, and weight is always the long pole in the tent, you know, our gross, are gross with the J model. I flew the J heavy A eight six J. All military aircraft have a has a letter designation for the model that they're in. So like the O eight six A, that was the first Lopes. That was the first Little Bird, mm-hmm. and it had a four bladed rotor, two bladed tail rotor, and a a C eighteen engine, <laughs> which is about I don't know one hundred and eighty horsepower. You know back back in the day, but. So we had, we had gotten with McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, whoever it was back then, but it, was, it used to be Hughes helicopter. Mr. Hughes designed and developed the OH-6. So we started talking to them, looking at upgrading the rotor system, Up looked at upgrading the weapon systems. And me as a, and us as old guys, we didn't want any of that glass cockpit. We wanted to flip a you know, we want a master arm switch, and when it went up to arm, the, the guns would shoot. Mm-hmm. And and, and it, we went through some growing pains with it because of the electronic. It was all glass, you know, glass up front, glass down on the panel. But, uh, man, it upped our gross weight, probably three or 400 pounds. So to us and to the ground force commander, we can carry more bullets. We can carry more gas, which gives them more time on station. You know, we tried to make it safer. We redesigned the seats and, you know, some of the some of the airframe of it to make it more efficient during flight, reduce that parasite drag. And, yeah, that was the AH-6M model, the mic. And I did get to fly it a couple times in combat towards the end. But yeah, it's it, it's just a heck of a helicopter. Can you kind of explain yeah, I, the uh, configurations for people that may not be familiar with the aircraft, like weapon oh, systems yeah, sure, or sure. stuff? So there's first there's there's two companies in the one sixtieth. There's A company and there's B company. So A company flies Little Birds, but they're the lift, the Little Bird lift company. They have planks on the side of the helicopter where the customers i still call them customers where the the shooters ride so we can put now we can put three on each side and then a dog back in the cargo area or whatever the case but those helicopters can get in very small places we can land on you know real small roofs or land at the front door you know wherever so that's their mission and then the AH or the attack helicopter is our standard configuration or dual miniguns. We carry Dillon Arrow M134 miniguns on the inboard of the plank. And then we carry two seven shot rocket pods, 2.75 inch rockets on the outboards of the plank. So this plank, all it does is it runs through the cargo area right behind the pilots. And we just, we just hang the guns and the rocket pods on those. That's pretty wild. And, and we can cross 
if we, you know, if a if ACO needs an MH, we can strip it. Say, here you go, man. Here, if we need an AH, so they're interchange. You know, we can interchange. Now, I've talked to a couple of the pilots before, and Huey pilots use the same aiming standards as you guys do. They use the old mm-hmm. grease pencil on the windscreen, uh, Pipper. Yeah. A lot of you talk to these guys, and they're like, yeah, so I count the rivets left and up or whatever, and that's where my spot is. That's how I maintain my spot, which is really awesome. You know, it's like a unique way of aiming and, and maintaining your, like, where do I aim at? But do you maintain that spot across all your aircraft? And if so... Yes, then how are the guns zeroed? Are they just zeroed in one way and everybody just, everybody learns how to shoot that gun? You know what I'm saying? Yes, that's a great question. But our armament personnel, so we had crew chiefs and then we have armament. We called them dogs, armament dogs. And that Mm -hmm. was lovingly. But they would use a gunner's quadrant and then a tape measure on every airframe. So they would... They'd set the, the, the rocket pods, and then they'd set the mini guns. Very, it, it's very small movements. But, again, we have, to, we have to provide surgical, precise shooting for the ground, ground force. Mm-hmm. So they'd set the rocket pods, and then they'd set the mini guns. And, and, uh, but, yes, they had a standard for, you know, where the bullets would impact out at, you know, X meters on every airframe and and for me you talk i counted so it was 21 rivets and then it was over the inside of my left pedal that's where my that's pretty awesome yeah that's that's cool stuff man you know getting into an aircraft like that like i said you know again coming from a cobra and apache that rawness of that aircraft it had to be I mean, how long does it take you to get used to that, you know, to used to flying that? You know, how long are you in training before you even get to do a real mission? Oh, gosh. Well, for for the 160th, it's it's broken down. So when you, when you finish Green Platoon, which is our training platoon, and depending on the airframe that you go into, MH6, AH6, Black Hawk Chinook. So the AH-6 track or the length of training is the longest because we have to go shoot and we have to learn how to shoot to their, to that ground force standard. And it just takes us longer. So the lift guys and it's, and we navigate, we, you know, we don't use any electronics and the standard still stands today. You have a map with your route on it. So you have to be an expert at reading terrain and and the route and air speeds and where's your wind coming from is it a headwind is it a tailwind is it a crosswind where is it you know is it blowing me left is it blowing me right Do i need to slow up because our standard at the target is for us to arrive plus or minus 30 seconds and you have to maintain that standard and it's a map a clock and a compass and that's how you get to the target it's crazy with all the GPSs and everything, what people are using nowadays, yep. like. Yep. Now we'll have that, but as, as expert navigators, we will use that to back up our expert navigation. For sure. Well, I mean, we had, we had started getting the same thing in the Marine Corps and the military in general, the JTACs started getting these tablets, you know, that have all mm-hmm. the map data and everything and the pilots did as well, obviously. And it almost became an issue with new guys. You're like, no, bro, you can't use the tablet. Like you have to be on map and you know, you got to bust out the old protractor and do the math and do everything because what if the tablet runs out of battery? What if you crack it? What if a million you have to learn how to use mills, you know, sure. and that, all that old school stuff. It's, uh, you know, it goes back to shooting. You know, I learned going through the sniper course, you know, we had a pencil and we use mill dots and you know there wasn't any of these all this stuff they have nowadays man you stick the thing up there and it gives you the wind and it calculates your ballistics and yeah no that was you had to know because batteries die and shit gets broken yeah uh that was the same kind of thing when i was a uh ford observer you know we wouldn't let guys use the um laser rangefinder until mm-hmm. they they got down to the standard and the standard was yeah. target location within 
within 200 meters in two minutes or less. And it's Good. like, you have two minutes to, you have to be within 200 meters or less when we're shooting artillery, you know, go. And when you can meet that consistently, then we'll talk about, okay, now you can use the laser range finder to, to speed up the process. Sure. But you, but if you don't know how to plot on a map and do a direction and do wow. corrections off that, then you're useless, you know? Cause like if yep. something happens to your technology, you're useless. You're just a, now you're just a strap yep. hanger. You are. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So for those that are watching my camera change, cause my, I don't know what happened. The other one just kind of canceled on me. So anyways, kind of bright. <laughs> well, yeah, I went from my actual like HD camera to my MacBook camera. So now I'm actually looking at my oh. laptop. Yeah. That's weird. Um, so you, you get to the unit, you get all this training, you're doing all these things, you're out shooting, you're, you know, you're becoming the best pilots that the army can create. And then nine 11 happens. Right. Yeah. And this is when, what Chris Moyer and I were talking about in our episode was the, those first mission into Afghanistan, the longest air raid in the history, you know, helo raid in the history yeah. um, and world history, I think actually. Yes, it was. So you got pulled out of the cockpit for that though. You know, what was yeah. your feeling at the time? <laughs> I was not a happy man. I was not, but I was honored that, you know, the ground force dealt the Delta commander, our command, you know, had their full faith and confidence in my abilities to be the fire support officer for task force sword. And that's who we were when we first in 01, when we went into Afghanistan mm -hmm. and, uh, but I, I, and I, I made the commander promise me general daily two star at the time. I said, all right, sir. I said, I'm going to do this, but I'm also an AH guy and I want to, <laughs> I want to get in the fight. He's like, I know. For sure. Terry, I, I yeah. know. But, yeah, and I mean, you know, God puts us in those places, and it's all about his timing and, you know, where we're supposed to be and when we're supposed to be there. That, uh, no, I, I was just, I was so honored. and I, I was, yeah, I mean, I just, I went and did my job. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was important for the whole team you know, because we went up, I had a, a dedicated AC 130U model. Yeah. That I did several, several missions in the early, early days. To, I went out and recce the helicopter route, you know, for the, for the helos that were going to go to Objective Gecko and then Objective Rhino for the Rangers, you know. So, yeah, we went out and set the conditions for that raid. So looking back, I was like, wow, man, I can't believe I did all this crap. You know? Oh, yeah, dude. What was the feeling, you know, amongst the group of people you were with knowing you are the response to 9-11? You're, you're it. You know, you are where millions of Americans would want to have been at that time to be the people that are, you know, seeking that retribution immediately after. Yeah, man, it, it was doggone it. I was just... I, I never really thought about it till years later, but it, there was my buddy, Jim Hosey. He was an AH guy in BCO and I was telling him about it, you know, and he was like, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you're going to get in it before any of us, <laughs> even yeah. you son of a gun, you know, and sure enough, I was up there firing the first shots. What was your role now? You were the fire support officer for this, but what, what was that? What's the meaning of that for people that don't know? Yes, sir. So my, in the early days, so early, late September, early October, you know, we had, we had nothing. We had nothing in that, in the country of Afghanistan. So our role was to, to go in the country, to engage targets of opportunity and to set the conditions for combat operations. So it was to get that special operations ground force and keep in mind we were in the south, so, you know, if you look at Kandahar and go directly west in the desert and those, those southern mountains, that was our area of operation. Fifth group was in the north, and, and our plan was, you know, just to pinch them right in the middle. So fifth group was in the north doing their ops. We were in the south with the Rangers and Delta doing our operations. And, you know, and, and I mean... We didn't have a plan, man. <laughs> they just said, go out there, do good things, you know, go kill the bad guys. Roger that. And report. 
you know so what what are their forces what is their maneuverability what all these all these questions that the command had so that's what we did we just went in there and figured it out and targets would pop up but we'd come home empty every night yeah i bet 40 boat 40 mike mike and 25 so how was the like logistics and planning for this longest helo raid in history you know that had to have been Gosh, it had to have been a real like nut to crack you know yeah it it was but it, again we have we had the best team on the planet doing this man yeah. i mean we do and we always will and i mean there at some points the the old man or or general daly he would be like hey i'm i'm gonna put a suggestion box at the at the front of the talk on the table mm -hmm. and if anybody has an idea put it in that box and we're we're just trying to figure things out you know we were we lost all of our intel assets from a, a former administration in that part of the world they cut the money they pulled everybody out so mm -hmm. You know, the other agencies, they had to go in blind and they had to reestablish those connections with, you know, all all the tribes and the leadership and doggone. It was looking back, man, it was I don't see how they did it, but we did it because we don't quit. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it would have been crazy to, to be running these kind of fire support plans for these initial operations. I'm sure they mm -hmm. were. I'm sure they were intricate, you know, with uh, a lot of yeah. different assets uh, lending a hand. Yeah, and we weren't the only show in town. I mean, I had fixed wing at Bombers, you know. I mean, we were working targets all over that our, our AO and fifth group was working their, you know, their plan up north. So. And you were commanding this from not the operation, obviously, but the fires from the back of an AC-130. So the ship mm -hmm. you were in was you were it was a command and control you were doing mm -hmm. excuse me, you were doing command and control at the same time that they were executing operations absolutely roger that yep how did you yeah, know i've never worked out of, i've never Mark, i've never worked you know, out of the back of one of those how was that oh it was awesome man yeah it's yeah we had we had an amazing crew and and we're still friends today from freaking 21 years ago you know and, how could you not yeah, be? yeah. We were all excited. We were very excited, and we were pissed off. Oh, I'm pissed sure, pissed. man. Yeah, we wanted to go get some. Yeah, chasing Bin Laden through the mountains. You know, that's uh. Yep. Yep. Al Qaeda, Taliban, you name it. In retrospect, there's been a lot of people talk about, um, you know, Bin Laden in the mountains and how that could have gone better. Is there, from your point of view? Is there anything we could have done? Could we have gotten them earlier? Was there a way to cut them off from getting out through there, through the Tora Bora area? Well, I'll probably get some kickback from this, but I'm telling you, and it's, I wrote it. It's in my book. We killed him in early 2002. You think so? Oh, I know so. I know so. Yep. I'm going to pick That's up the all book to read about that. I have to pick up the book to read about this. This I'll is. I'll send you. I gotta send you. I meant to send you one, brother, but yeah. Oh, I'll send you. One. Oh, I appreciate I'll write it. About it. Yeah. That's crazy. There's all obviously. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories out there about that. I remember right after he was, I guess, supposedly killed. You know, in 2000, what 13 or 2000, end of 2012, and I, I had an appointment. Was it 11? Well, right. Either way, right after that, I had a deployment coming up, and my mom was like, "Are you? Do you still have to go? Like he's dead now?" And I'm like, "Yeah, mom. I don't know what the war. Yes. We're just going now." Somebody took his place. Oh man, yeah. So yeah, man. What a what an what an interesting like aspect you have on that, <laughs> like on these historical events and stuff, you know? Well, and he was a very sick man. He had he had to have dialysis every day. His kidneys were gone. And there's just, there's no way he, yeah, anyway, if you want to, if you want to talk about it, you'll have to go to the CV in Texas. All right. I might have to do that. That's interesting. I'll have to look yeah. into it more. Um, yeah. What was after That's that then? Theory. That's your theory, obviously. Mm -hmm. What was, what was, you know, what was next on, what was up next after this invasion into Afghanistan? Obviously you guys didn't stay there forever. 
you guys rotated out with other people. What was on, what was on the books for you when you rotated out? Yeah. And it's, I'll go back to setting the conditions in that. And it was, it was for the raid. It was over a thousand mile aerosol that the 160th Delta and the Rangers did. And we raided Omar's, I call it his ranch. It was Southwest of Kandahar, but it was just to let these some of bitches know, Hey, we're here and we ain't leaving mm -hmm. until we kill every one of you sons of bitches. Mm -hmm. And it, that it was, and, and, and it's out there and I'm sure you've read, but on target that night, the guys left FDNY hats, NYPD hats, American flags, and we want we wanted them to know that we're coming. Mm -hmm. And we, but we had, you know, that was 19 October 01 was the invasion. Uh, 375 Rangers did an airfield seizure at Objective Rhino, and then we hit Objective Gecko. That's that was the primary target. So we did that. And then we can we consistently constant combat operations again keep in mind fifth group was up north pushing south doing their thing and and the the commanders in state which was president bush destroy all taliban and al-qaeda and we did that in about nine weeks mm -hmm. our mission was complete they were gone we killed them all so if you look back and you think about it, what we did in nine weeks, the Russians couldn't do in eight years. Eight years, a very small force of special operators. Yeah. That's something to think about. Yeah, I mean, it was so, it was great effects at first, right? It was that follow-on yeah. where we didn't really, leadership didn't really know what the hell was going on, so we just kind of stayed there. <laughs> I don't think any of us did, man. We just... Oh, we did. We were like, okay, find the bad guys and go shoot them. Yeah. Okay, right, got it. That's yeah. easy. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the kind of tasking most people want, right? Keep it that simple. Yeah. Man. Yeah, and then we we got we finished there, and they're like, okay, you guys are going home, and oh, by the way, we're going to start planning another invasion. <laughs> we're like, all right, man, let's go. Is it like in the Bahamas or, you know, <laughs> yeah, <right>. somewhere, <laughs> somewhere cool or, I don't know, it's in the Middle East. So, yeah, we got home, we hit the ground running and start planning the invasion for Iraq. And what's what's crazy about that is that you and your unit were part of the, like, initial attacks into Iraq even yeah. before the, like, official, like, invasion date. You guys were going yes. in and taking care of those like high priority targets. So. Yep. Yeah. B company fired the first shots of the Iraq war too. So we did, we went in on 19 March, 2003, whereas the main force launched on 21 March, 2003. But yeah, we had, we had two nights of missions. We had four teams so it was eight total AHs. There's always two AHs in a team. Plus, we had an MH with us that had a flare on it. So we went backwards. Remember the old pink teams from Vietnam, the Loach and the Cobras, so the guns. Mm -hmm. And the MH would go forward. They'd, they'd confirm our target you know, with the flare. He would bust off, and then the AHs would come in and work over the target. And then we had A-10s with us overhead. Love me some hogs. Love it. But we, we worked with them to where our most vulnerable point is when our trail or dash two breaks off the target and he's, he's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So we, and this was months of coordination and training with those guys. So as soon as dash two breaks, the A-10 already tipped and he's, and as soon as he cleared, here comes some 30. Nice. <laughs> Man. It was cool. Now, are you guys, when, you, when you're working in teams like that and you have A-10s in support, are you working as a FAC A, as a Ford Air Controller Airborne, yes. for those that don't know? Yeah, we, and that's a, that's a great point that in B Company, we were, the, we were the first airborne 
helicopter FACAs hmm. certified or in special operations. Yep. Yeah. So for those that don't know, a FACA is basically a JTAC that's a pilot. They fly around. Yes. They direct airstrikes for other aircraft. They manage the airspace. Like if they're the if they're the FAC A in charge, then they're managing the airspace. They're stacking aircraft at different altitudes so that they don't run into each other. And they're and they're yeah. employing them to employ their ordinance as best as possible and get the effects that they're looking for. Yeah. So Most that's kind efficient. of yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's uh, I mean, so you guys are going out in pairs and just seeking mm-hmm. out Iraqi targets and blowing them up. No, we have pre-planned targets. Okay. We have pre-planned targets. Yes, sir. Yeah, and then anything that popped up, then, yes, have, we would engage them. Did you guys have yeah, issues had, with ADA or air defense at all? No. No, we – no, there was some very <laughs> – there was some very fine coordination, and and no, nobody was shooting anything in those first two days. It was just, just the AHs out there hunting and Delta. Delta went – I had a bet with some buddies of mine from C Squadron who who had crossed the berm first, and of course I won. And uh, <laughs> I was like, "No wonder you guys are ground pounders. You ain't very smart. I'm in a helicopter, dude." Yeah, bro. Yeah, I'm setting the conditions yeah. for you. Yeah, but it it was good fun. You know, we're always going against each other. So. What a crazy what a crazy mission that is, though, right? I mean, because you guys are flying complete darkness. You're not, you don't have technology in the cockpit to tell you where to go or do anything. No. It's all just no. you and the dude sitting next to you and making yes. it happen. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Yeah, we were navigating on our maps. And, uh, yeah, on our clock, we had our TOTs, our time on targets. And, man, we just we went and worked. How good was we your maps and imagery at that time? This is the opening days. Pretty good. Yeah. That's cool. Pretty, yeah. I mean, we had the old, we used the old layer jog maps, yeah, you know, the one to two hundred fifties, because I mean it's freaking desert. There's there's nothing out there. It's just yeah, yeah. time disappeared. And you know, there's not a city or a road intersection or a branch or yeah. You just yeah, you just did your expert navigation. And you got to the target. Man, yeah, yeah. that's crazy yeah. though. So once the war was actually ongoing or actually kicked off. What was your guys' mm-hmm. role? We continued to seek and destroy. And, you know, you had a lot of Iraqi maneuver elements moving. And and we did we did some work for 5th Group one night. They were, the commander had, had come in. At the time, it was Colonel Mulholland. Now it's General Mulholland. But mm-hmm. he had asked to help out some of his boys. They were getting some harassment and interdiction fire up by Medasis and but we did a at like D plus four, we D plus four five. We did an airfield seizure with one seven five Rangers and Medasis. So it was a strategic points. It, it was strategic points after that, supporting Rangers and Delta, that ground force that was maneuvering. Now I've heard yeah. you I've actually heard you talk about the um, battle at Haditha Dam. Was that on this deployment? Yeah. Was that on that first deployment or was that a follow on deployment? Yeah. Oh, that was, yeah, that started in late March of 03. And it was a, it was a mission with 375 Rangers. They, so Haditha Dam, let me put this in perspective. It was the most strategic point in that country because it's hydroelectric. It provided electricity from all the way down the, is it the Euphrates? All the way to Baghdad. Mm-hmm. So, and 375 Rangers got the mission, and there's an airfield about about 20 miles to the west of there. So, they did an airfield seizure, did a combat jump to seize that airfield. So, then we could come in on fixed wing and land with the AHs and the MHs. Of course, our ground, our FARP guys, our crew chiefs, and... But that dam, it's one of the largest dams in the world. It's almost five miles across that dam. That's crazy. It's, it, you know, and you think, dam, you know, at your local lake or, you know, even Hoover Dam. I mean, I'm like, okay, it's a dam. But I was like, holy smokes, you know, looking at 
imagery of it. I was like, that is a big place. That is a big place. And it was over 300 foot high. Plus there are wires everywhere. So wires and helicopters don't do well. So yeah, that, that was an, and you know, the Iraqis thought that the Americans were going to come take it and destroy it. And then we thought, you know, oh gosh, the Iraqis going to come take this thing, blow it up or, you know, whatever. So mm-hmm. it, it, we we're just kind of both doing that where we could have, you know, the, the two leaders could have met in the middle with swords or what pistols. It's like, okay, man. Yeah, we, we got it. Let, let's not cause all this bloodshed, but yeah, we sure did. But went the hard it route. Was, it was the Alamo. I ain't kidding. How yeah. so? That's, that's my biggest chapter in the book, Adita Dam. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, there were, I think there were, there were 138 total. So it was, it was 375 Rangers and then some Delta guys. I think they're eight to 10. They were heavy breachers and snipers. And because we had to clear all that dam, mm-hmm. the whole thing, and either gather intel or, or secure it, you know, make sure nobody took it. And the 375 commander in the, original mission statement was take take hold the dam and within 24 hours we'll we'll take relief on station from an armor unit a tank unit that was coming well they didn't show up for seven days <laughs> and we were like oh man where's this where are these tanks mm-hmm. but so it was you know it was it was light infantry the two ahs and the weather during the whole siege was would not allow any fixed wing in because it was overcast, mm. very low ceilings. So, you know, nobody could get in there, but the, the two AHs. Yep. And, oh, there's, there's all different stories out there, but they, they told us the first night we killed between 800 and 1200 enemy. No way. Really? A, Holy crap. Yeah. They said it, it was a force. Well, just south of there was a very large military base. Mm-hmm. It was a division of Iraq. And then they had Fedayeen, you know, their special operations or their very regular um, yeah. dudes. So they thought, oh, they're they're gonna come blow that dam and it's gonna you know it's gonna kill our families, it's gonna kill everything down downstream of that dam. So yeah, they came to fight and to fight us. And yeah, I'm not kidding, man. It was, it was like the Alamo. <laughs> it was, yeah, I was like, oh, tonight's the night. I, I probably won't get through this one, but we did. Yeah. And that every night afterwards, man, what a, what, a, what do the radio calls sound like in a, an event like that? Man, it, it was terrible in the beginning because we, the Rangers did an airfield seizure. So they parachuted onto that seized it secured it and we actually came in on a c-17 three little birds <laughs> and a tank yes it's a good matchup so we air we air landed we offloaded got our updates and then took off mm-hmm. so i was on the radio trying to get in touch with the fsnco sergeant mo he was the ranger fire support, non-commissioned officer, fire support sergeant on that objective. And he was in the Western BP blocking position. He and I think there were six Rangers there. And they had a blocking position on the Eastern side. It was five or six Rangers. But I could hear Mo on the radio, but I could not, I couldn't talk to him. And he would ask, you know, he was talking to the talk, his, his command there at, it was H one was the name of the airfield hotel one. And I, he's like, where are the AHs? Where are the AHs? Where are the AHs? And every time he keyed the mic, I could hear sporadic gunfire and I could hear outgoing gunfire. And then as time started to progress, it got more intense, more intense. And, you know, the voices started to kind of go up and, octaves and 
And I was just like, doggone. So we're flying. We're headed there. It's about a, I don't know, about a 16, 17 minute flight to the dam from H1, from our FARP or forward arming refueling point that our guys set up at H1. And man, I was so frustrated. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the gun, I mean, it was just constant. Every time he keyed the mic, it was constant, you know, 240 outgoing fire, AK fire, mortars. And, uh, and I remember telling the guy I was flying with, I said, I was just so angry. We were probably six, five, six minutes out. And I said, a man standing on the moon in the sixties can talk to Houston, Texas. And I can't talk to my fire supporter six miles away. And so I finally, I went up on our sat, on our sat radio. Mm -hmm. I said, all stations this net, clear the net, clear the net. And I got him on the sat. And I said, we're inbound brother. I said, what do you need? And he goes, Oh, he said, uh, ETA. And I said, you know, three or four minutes. He said, we ain't going to last three or four minutes, dude. Man, my heart sunk. And we pulled a little more power. You know, I mean, we, those helicopters were running in the red. And, man, the, the gun, every time he keyed the mic, I just, I couldn't hear him because the gunfire was so intense. And we, we came in over the lake from the north. The MH let he he stayed behind us, and what was great about those guys is having them as a as a uh, like a seesaw, you know, or something happened, or if we got shot down, or if we had a mouth uh, helicopter broke, and we had to land. Man, they could they could scoop us right up. Mm-hmm. Plus, they could watch our six o'clock for us while we were in the fur balls, so to speak. But we came in over the lake. And uh, probably about 10, 15 feet, and dams right in front of us. And there were just, <laughs> there were just tracers just everywhere. And I was like, and we looked at each other, the guys flying with, and we, we started laughing. We're like, we're fucked. <laughs> Excuse my French, <laughs> About man. to get into this mess. Yeah, so, and we knew where they were. It was on that western side. And we bumped, we bump up in that particular helicopter one to gain altitude and then two to give us a good you know a good overview of the battlefield Mm -hmm. and to find that target and uh we bumped up and i said we're inbound hot i said danger close he said roger he said shoot right in front of us and he said we shot 12 meters in front of 12 meters there was a company size element attacking their position yeah what were how, how did your attacks look were you running straight guns were you doing rockets and guns on this so like what was the it, i mean cause you, i'm sure you had to part. like i'm sure you had to spread it out over time right because you only have so much ammo on one of those little birds yeah and and it would you know and that's part of our job as professional gun pilots to manage that you know to manage it one and two to use the right munition for that target Mm-hmm. So personnel, you know, scored a minigun. Our minigun shot out 132 bullets per second for two guns. So it didn't take much. And, of course, there's a lead aircraft and then a trail aircraft. So lead would come in and shoot. You know, dash two would find another target or more targets. Or, I, or we would tell them, hey, shoot that same target. You know, if it was a structure or an armored vehicle, you know, a rocket. Or we can also, we, we also carried a GAL-19, and that's a three-barrel, 50-caliber Gatling gun. So we carry it on the left side, just that gun, and then a minigun of rockets. So that would, that would allow us to engage tanks, armored vehicles, or personnel with a minigun, or rockets on a building, you know, so, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, man. Yep. That's, um, so again you have to manage that to like, yeah, to make this last. Cause if you're, you're, you're talking about almost a thousand people, you know, yeah. <laughs> you don't have enough rounds for that. So no. what was, did you guys have a replacement section coming 
in? Like, were you guys the initial and there's another section getting ready to come in and replace you and you guys kind of yo-yo back and forth after farping or, or what? Or was it just oh, man, one good we run? It. We were it. That was it, but, man. And each guy, you know, you'll manage. I mean, you can get 15 to 17 engagements, you know, with because we got 14 rockets and we got mini guns. And, uh, but when the, the Rangers drove into that target and we had embedded a fart with them, so they put in, it was about, I don't know, four or five clicks from the dam. They put in a clandestine fart for us. So we had fuel, we had bullets, we had rockets. And, but, and we have four loads there. And then we, we depleted that pretty quick. <laughs> and uh, so then we had to go all the way back to H1. It was about a seven, 16, 17 minute flight one way. And our guys had our, I mean, our guys, they look like a NASCAR pit crew, man. We land, and they refuel us. They rearm the miniguns, they reload the rockets, and we're in and out of there in minutes flat. Now that that first fart, then the pilots, we get out. <laughs> we yeah, get, yeah. we friction everything down, we jump out, we load the cans, we load the guns, we load the rockets, jump back in, and take off and go do it. It's obviously yeah. you guys are throwing down some devastation on the enemy forces there. What was their response to you? Were they trying to shoot you down? Was there any oh, yeah. kind of like, I mean, for those that may not know, the little birds, you guys get down and dirty. You get down into the fight. You're flying feet off the ground sometimes. Yeah. You're dropping guys right on rooftops and stuff. The oh, threat, I was drop, we're dropping hand grenades on dudes. Yeah? <laughs> Out the door. That's old school. Yeah. That's like World War One biplane stuff, dropping the bomb, yeah. you know? Yeah, and our, our SOP, our standard operating procedure, in combat, whoever's not on the controls, you've got your M4 up. And it's really? very effective. Yeah, we so we can suppress, engage targets of opportunity. Yeah, we're, we're shooting dudes out the door, man. But so that shows how low you are. How do you mm -hmm. yourselves not get shot down or get shot? You know, because there's no armor on these things, obviously. No. There's none. We, I mean, we, our kit, you know, we've got soft armor and then plates and that's, that's it. That's it. I don't know, man. The, the good Lord watches over. It's just a hope and a prayer, huh? Yeah. yeah. Man. Hope and a prayer, hope and a prayer. Fly into a firestorm of and lead. It's just... So it's, you know, I, I don't think I've really put that home, but this is all at night. We're flying with night vision goggles. So that, you know, that's, we're night stalkers. For sure. We own the night, so. Man, just the threat yeah. of even hitting one of those wires you're talking about at night. Oh, God, man. Yeah, it was, it was busy. It was, yeah, it was busy. You're we were both scared shitless. <laughs> I was going to say, you're, you're probably as close to death, you know, on the edge of death as anyone has ever been. You know, that, I can't oh. imagine a situation much more dangerous than something like that. Where you're, yeah. you're, it's so bad. You're dropping hand grenades out of the helicopter. Like that's fucking crazy. Yeah, yeah. that's we another sure way did. to do it, I guess. Man, yeah. whatever it takes, whatever it takes to defeat the enemy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, that's the, but that's what a unit like the 160th want, right? You know, they want someone that's stinking outside the box. Why not throw grenades out the door if you can? Always. You know? Yeah, uh, we got our asses chewed in Afghanistan for doing it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, the old man pulled us into his tent one night after the deep. He, he said, no more Haggardades out of the cockpit. And I think my remark was, well, heck, sir, y'all did it in Vietnam. Well, that was Vietnam. There's no more Haggardades out of the cockpit. Take away like, all the fun. Oh, yeah, wink, wink. Okay. Yeah, yeah, One of the, one of the Delta Star Majors told him, he's like, hey, sir, it's, it's B Company, the six guns. They're just trying to kill something. Just doing your thing, right. man. Oh Lord! Hey, as long as it's effective, it's not stupid, right? No, Fuck, man. we so, had a system. You know, we let the other guy know. Hey, frag, frag out, pin, frag out, boom. Man, so. that's wild, though, from a helicopter. <laughs> so, 
I, you know, I mentioned the concern is obviously because you're doing these low flying missions and stuff like that. The danger is being shot down or being hitting a structure or something that you may not see in your night vision. Unfortunately, you've had that experience, uh, not, not mm-hmm. hitting something, but being shot down. Can you talk yeah. us through like what that was like? Cause I'll be honest, man, I've never seen, I've seen a couple shoot down videos of helicopters and it never seems like it goes well for a helicopter. You know, so the yeah. the fact that you're even here and giving this interview and talking about it is just on another level. Yeah, I'm blessed for sure. And uh, yeah, so that that was Iraq 04, and it was March on 18 March. And I, and I'll just kind of draw this picture. So <clears throat> the insurgency had started in late fall of 03 because. Mm-hmm. The Americans were there, and I mean, every Al Qaeda and every Muslim was was coming to fight fight us. So <clears throat> we were hitting targets. We we're really busy in Fallujah, Ramadi, and then Amaria. So if you draw it on a map, it's a triangle. <clears throat> we kind of nicknamed it the Devil's Triangle. In that triangle. There have been seven U.S. helicopters shot down in that triangle over a period, of, and it wasn't very long. It was probably, I don't know, five, six weeks. Oh, wow. And I don't think there there have been any survivors. I mean, it was 58, a couple Marine Corps helicopters have been shot down, a couple Chinooks full of, you know, troops. And <clears throat> we'd been in... We we're operating in Fallujah the night of the 18th, night morning of the 19th, and we got we got intel off of a target that another guy that high value target that we were hunting was going to be at a house in Fallujah at 10 that morning. So we were like, oh God, man, no, because we hadn't done a day mission since 3 4 October 1993. We all know how that turned out. So mm-hmm. that was in Mogadishu. Battle of the Black Sea or Black Hawk Down. <clears throat> so the the Sergeant Major says, Hey, you guys just you hang out here. We're gonna drive in and you know, crank up hundred percent, get on the radios. If we need you, we'll call you. And we could have been there in two or three minutes for fire support. So we did. They got that they hit that target and got some intel off it. Hello, so uh, hi honey. There's my beautiful wife. <laughs> and so this this other high-value high target was down in Amaria, which is about 16, 17 miles south of Fallujah. So Sergeant Major's like, hey, we're, gonna, we're just going to drive down there. We're going to kill this guy, and then I want you guys to go back to Baghdad. We we're still living at Baghdad International Airport there. The force was still there. And uh, we've been up, we've been up for days, man, operate, you know. And so we said, okay, so we we flew back to Baghdad to Biop, Baghdad International Airport. And it was around, it was just afternoon, and a radio call came in that they had, that recce team had had a tick. So a tick is troops in contact. So they'd been ambushed and they'd stirred the hornet's nest down there. And it, it, it was the wild, wild west, man. I mean, it was, there were bad guys everywhere. Mm-hmm. Blue, of course, you know, we all know what happened. Fallujah 1, Fallujah 2, mm-hmm. Ramadi. And uh, just some of the, the Marines had some of the toughest fighting since World War II. And the 82nd Airborne, they were in there in the beginning, you know, again, some of the hardest fighting since World War II. And so we made the decision, hey, we're going to go help the guys. Man, they're in trouble. So we jumped in the AHs. It was, I don't know, probably 11 or 12-minute flight to their location and got on station. And uh, we, we had done what we needed to do. And the troop commander called and says, hey, we're going to line up and we're going to, we're going, you know, we did what we need to do. We're headed back to Baghdad. Roger that. 
But when we took off from there, every one of us said the same thing. The hair just stood up on our necks. It's that sixth sense. Mm -hmm. It was daytime, you know, and it was a bad, bad place. It just was. But, and we all know that if you get in trouble, we're coming. And we don't care what the situation is, but we're coming to get you. Never shall I fail a comrade. Never shall I leave a fallen comrade. So we went and been on station probably six, seven minutes. And I just, I'd flown really low over the vehicles. So there were three up armored gun trucks and then two panders. So they're big six wheel armored vehicles that Delta drives. Yeah. Kind of did the swoop just to check, make sure everything they were, and I, was, I started a climbing right-hand turn. I was at about 160 feet, headed in a southwestern direction, and boom, this freaking giant explosion. And I was like, holy crap. The aircraft shook, started sh- shaking, and my co-pilot in the left seat said, uh, it was about a one-meter long. He said it was a white hot rod went right by my head. It was an SA-16, shoulder launch, you know, IR seeker, and that's what had been shot at us. Uh, Two of the guys on the ground saw the shot, came from a two-story building, so they suppressed immediately, and then, you know, they're like, oh, crap, man, Greg's hit. And uh, it's really weird that, I mean, the best way I can explain it is that my world went frame by frame by frame like a movie reel. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were just to look at those, it just went click, click, click. Everything slowed down. But that's that adrenaline. You know, I understand the physiology of us, what happens. And I went to work, man. I entered an auto rotation and started down. And I do recall I, I had a tailwind, so that was that wasn't the best conditions to, you know, to perform an auto rotation. Plus, we were full of, of I mean, we shot a little bit, but had gas and ammo on, so we we're real, real heavy. And you know, in a, a helicopter pilot, we we use, you know, like trees or buildings or things to help us judge our distance from the ground or height above the ground because there there are certain things mechanics that we have to do in an auto rotation to get that aircraft safely on the ground Mm -hmm. so at at, and we have a radar altimeter in our helicopter so i was cross-checking very very quickly and and i saw it you know at 75 feet i need to start a d-cell and then you know prepare for my touchdown and i remember seeing 75 feet I did a real aggressive D cell because I didn't want much ground run because I, it's just dirt. You know, there's nothing out there to, to look at, to judge your height above the ground. <clears throat> and then at about 20 feet, you want to level the helicopter and then pull cushion with the collective to kind of, it just kind of slows you down. And then about the last two or three feet, you, you pull the rest of that collective and it puts pitch in those rudder blades to cushion that landing. So mm-hmm. it's kind of it's just a powered off landing is what it is. So I did everything, you know, and later I was thinking about, you know, Neil Armstrong landing on the moon. I was like, I got one shot, man. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't screw this up. And we landed and the other AH, he saw us. And, you know, later he's like, dude, it was the prettiest auto rotation I'd ever seen in my life. And I was like, well, only had to do one. Yeah. Of course, the guy's on the ground, so now they're fully engaged. They're maneuvering, you know, to protect us. And then the other AH went to go start support them with the CAS. And we touched down, and we slid about, I don't know, it's probably about 35, 40 meters. <clears throat> I only. And um, just, 
I mean, it, and again, it was a slow motion. It was just frame by frame. I can I can remember every little bit of it. But it's that dirt over there, and it's not sand. It's dirt, but it's just like talcum powder. So that that had come in the cockpit. And I made sure the collector was all the way down. I just held everything where I had it. And we went down a bit of a slope into some soft dirt and the skid stuck when, cause I was still carrying some airspeed. But when the skid stick, you do this. Mm-hmm. We started and I remember hearing the rotor blades hit, the, hit the dirt and then going and I grew up cowboying and breaking horses and, you know, and, and when a horse starts bucking, well, you always, you know, you kind of do this right here. And I can remember, I was like, oh, no, you know, and we kept going. We wound up rolling end over end two and a half times when we came to rest and birded on my, yeah, upside down, my side low. And uh, it knocked us both out just very shortly. But I came to... And, you know, the first thing you want to do, you, you, you do that check. Hey, my feet. Okay. I got hands. I'm, you know, those are good. Mm-hmm. I can move my legs. And, but I kept hearing this popping sound. I was like, what in the Sam Hill is, is that gunfire? No, it's not gunfire. But, and I remember hearing the other A8 shooting mini guns. And I remember hearing the guys, their fifties going off and their weapons and this popping, it just getting. Then I was like, "Holy crap, that's ammo cooking off." Mm. We were on fire. <laughs> I mean, we were fully engulfed on fire. Damn. So I, I looked at my co-pilot. Well, I grabbed my rifle. We carry our M4s right there in the in the cockpit with us. I mean, right with arms reach. And so I told my co-pilot, and I looked at him. Well, he had blood all over his face. And, I was like, oh, man, did he get hit? Did he? The little bird has a history of the shoulder harnesses not locking in a crash sequence. Mm. So what happens is the pilot hits the cycling right with his mouth. And, uh, oh, thank you, dear. So I thought about that. And just there's just a million things going on in my head. And then I was like, okay, security of the aircraft. There's a little black helicopter. Just got shot down Mm -hmm. 300 meters from, you know, the bad guys. We just stirred this horn's nest up. So I told him, I said, hey, I put my hand on his shoulder. And keep in mind, we're upside down (laughs) at this time. And I said, meet me over here at the 3 o'clock. And he nodded his head. Because you don't want to meet in the front of a gun bird because if a rocket goes off or a bullet goes off, then it'll, it could hurt you. Mm-hmm. So I got my rifle. I crawled out. I tried to stand up and my lip, my right leg didn't work. And I took a step and I fell down. I got up, I took a step, I fell down. And what had happened is it was, a, I'd broken my neck and my and L spine in a crash sequence. I cracked my helmet. When I hit the I hit the door frame in the crash sequence, but man, you're you're just running on adrenaline at this point, and it I mean our bodies are amazing, our brains are amazing at those times, and and you know you've been in those you've been in those times, man. I got I got to perform, I got to work, I got to do my job, and you just don't quit. Mm-hmm. So. And then I, I finally got down on the ground and I was like, man, maybe my leg's broken, you know? So I pulled the, pulled my pant leg up, looked and it wasn't broken. I felt kind of did a self-assessment. But what it was, I'd gotten a, a spinal cord stinger in my L spine and it just mashed on that, you know, that root that comes out. My leg wasn't working just right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, so then I'm like, okay, I got to make, I got to ensure safety of this, you know, me and my Mm co-pilot. So I did a, I just kind of did a a walk 360 degrees. I could, I could see the other AH, you know, in, in his dive shooting and breaking and I could hear the other vehicle shooting. And then I thought about in our, 
in our rucks and they hang in the in the cargo area right behind us where the minigun cans set. Well, we carry our night vision goggles. We carry grenades, water, ammo. I was like, oh, man, I need to get my ruck out of there. Well, I turn around and look. That cargo area is fully engulfed in fire now. Mm -hmm. I mean, this helicopter is burning, dude. And I was like, crap, where's my co-pilot? So I walk back over there. I get down on my hands and knees. And I'm like, get out. Get out right now. And he nodded his head. So I got back up. I kind of took a knee just in case somebody, you know, started coming up to us. And I, I glanced back. And I don't know what the time was. I have no idea. I glanced back. No co-pilot. So I said, okay. So I got back up there. I got on my belly. And I crawled inside the cockpit. And keep in mind, he's upside down hanging in his harness. I just reached up there and I, you know, I grabbed the latch mm -hmm. and down on his head he goes. And then he kind of, you know, he's kind of rolled over looking. He's like, I said, and I grabbed him. And when I, right when I pulled the latch, the fire was just rolling around his left arm. Jeez. So, yeah. And the ammo was cooking off. And I thought about the rockets. I had 17 pounders on board. I was like, man, what are those things going to do if they, you know, are they going to explode? Are they going to take off? Or, you know, they never, they just lay there and burn. Never hmm. did anything. That's crazy. I would have thought they would have so, launched at least. I, yeah, me too. Me, me too. But so I got him, I pulled him up on top of me and then I just started kind of kicking back, you know, and, and we kind of rolled to the side. I said, you okay? And he's like, yeah. I said, okay, man. I said, let's get up, and we moved about probably about 40, 50 meters to the east facing the ville, and there was a bit of a deflate there, and I said, hey, this is a good spot. I said, look, we're both, we're both kind of jacked up, and uh, he got in a prone, and then I got on a knee, and I said, hey, if you see something or if you hear something, you know, just tug on me or sing out or whatever, I said, let's put – both sets of eyes. I didn't want to shoot a friendly. For sure. And I mean, we're, you know, we were all jacked up. We were pumped up on adrenaline. And uh, then I heard a truck. And I go, hey, here comes a vehicle. And I heard it stop. And then again, we we're in, you know, a bit of a low piece of low ground there. Well, I saw this ball cap. Then I saw a beard. <laughs> I was like, and he was running full tilt, and I was like, "I, I know him. That's Chaz." <laughs> and, and and he and he he stops, and he just looks at us. And then he takes off running again. Well, we're we're you know standing up, and uh, he gets to us. And, man, he throws his arms around us and hugs us. He goes, "Man, we thought you guys were dead." I said, "No, man, we ain't dead." And later he told me I asked him for a fire extinguisher. <laughs> go find, go uh, put the fire on the helicopter. But oh, I was just sick, man. I was like, doggone it. I've lost the helicopter and I've hurt, you know, my brother. And, and he, and Chaz looks at me and he goes, he was in one of the gun trucks and he says, what do you want to do? My nickname's Gravy. He goes, what do you want to do, Gravy? I said, I want to go find that son of a bitch and kill him. <laughs> he goes, get in the truck. So, yeah, we spent the next six hours in a gunfight. That's crazy, man. Like, you were so lucky. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's to, to get we're shot blessed. down in a helicopter and survive is just unheard of almost. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they, they said we were the only crew. We were the eighth helicopter shot down in that triangle. I've got a theory about that because there were no more. And you can tell... You know, those SAs, SA-7, SA-14, SA-16, the Stinger, Post-Stinger, mm -hmm. they all have a signature, a smoke signature. And the two guys that saw the shot, they they said, dude, it was an SA-16. Well, there weren't, that's a very advanced yeah, weapon. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, they're, they had reported to us there were no 16s in country, maybe some 14s, but. And then they confirmed it. They scooped up the 
you know, burnt up helicopter and they, they sent it off. They did forensics on it, but they found a piece of metal in the right hand gun box that they confirmed it was an SA 16. That's so, crazy, man. Works as advertised. Yeah, I guess that's, <laughs> uh, that's just crazy. I mean, did you know when it, when you heard the explosion, did you know you had been shot down or did you just think like maybe the motor just blew up or something? No, I knew we'd been hit with something. Yeah. There was no, no doubt. My man, it was, it was a traumatic. I mean, the whole aircraft just, it just shuddered, but you know, it's like, oh man, you know, and you know, I mean, it's it's all training. I'm I'm an instructor pilot too, so you know, I mean, Muscle whistles memory. start going off and lights, and yeah, I just entered auto. Yeah. Now, I mean, how long before you were back in the cockpit? Oh, uh, let's see. That was March. So April, May, June. It was. It was. Um, I went up for a just a because the boss was like, "Hey, you know we got to get Greg back up." So and I was right. I said, "Hey, I'm re- let's get back on the horse. You know, you mm-hmm. get bucked off, get back on." Of course, they were worried about. There was a lot of stuff going on with me. I'd had a traumatic brain injury, and I was I was I've had over forty surgeries since then. I've got like forty six pieces of titanium in Jesus, me. Jesus, man. And uh, yeah, a life well lived. Can we take a timeout? So yeah. I can-